<laughs> Earthbound by Artemis Greenleaf. I didn't believe in ghosts, not until I became one. One problem, a big problem with being a ghost, is that you look just how you looked when you died. I was five years old when that happened. I've learned a lot since then, matured, as my friend Uno would say. But I still get treated like a little child. It isn't fair. I should be 13, almost grown. I should be in school with my own friends. I should be alive. Or maybe I shouldn't have stayed behind. But someone had to look after Sheridan. So many things I know now that I didn't know as a non-dead. And yet, so many things forgotten. The feel of rain. The smell of bread. The warmth of the sun. The cold of the moon. I've been dead eight years now, almost twice as long as I was alive. I'm good at basic ghost skills, moving things around, gliding, passing through walls. But until recently I hadn't bothered learning the more advanced stuff. It just hadn't seemed very important. But now I feel restless, like there's something I need, but I don't know what it is. Practicing new things keeps me from pacing this rocky old farm like the tiger in the Dublin Zoo. Yesterday, I was working on apparition, and I just couldn't get it right. Dad and my little sister were sitting at the breakfast table. Actually, Sheridan's not that little. She's eight, and she's never even seen a picture of me, much less my ghost. I started out behind Dad, but Sheridan could have seen me, if I'd been able to appear. Nothing I did worked. I moved closer and closer to Sheridan. I went around the table. I just hate the feeling of having a solid object going through me. I was practically breathing, well, if I did breathe, down the back of her neck, hoping that she'd notice me. Just as I was about to give up, something happened. My right hand and wrist appeared, bright and perfect, as if they were flesh. The only problem was, it looked like Sheridan's orange juice had suddenly sprouted a hand. Da! she gasped. What? He didn't look up from his newspaper. He wasn't really reading it so much as he was using it to hide his whiskey flask. He didn't used to be like that. We used to go for walks and hunt for treasures. He used to laugh. Da! Tessa! Tessa! Spit it out, girl, he growled. I managed to make my hand disappear just as he lowered the top of his paper and glared at Sheridan. Well? It's gone now, but I saw it, really I did. There was a hand, coming right out of my juice. A hand, you say? What kind? A child's? A woman's? His eyes searched the table scouring every crumb of food and speck of dust for ghostly evidence. I froze, even though I was sure he couldn't see me. I don't know. It was just a hand, Sheridan said, pushing her back against the chair. Dad rolled his mud-coloured eyes. There's nothing there now. This your idea of a prank? Not funny, sure. Don't be so childish. A vein in his forehead throbbed as he snapped the paper back up and muttered something under his breath that doesn't bear repeating. Now, I was in such a hurry to get away from the breakfast table that I hit the sugar bowl with my hand, the very part of me that I'd just made solid. The bowl skidded across the wooden surface and teetered on the edge for a second before it fell. Una, 
The farm's original owner caught it and set it back on the table. She wouldn't let it shatter on the floor. It was her favourite, a wedding present from her beloved Aunt Siobhan. Mama had found it in the attic, in an old steamer trunk, when we moved in. Dad looked up when he heard the noise of the sugar bowl sliding, and he saw it float for a second in the air before it set itself back on the table. I wonder, Dad thought out loud, could it be her? Who? Sheridan asked, getting out of her chair and backing away from him. I glided to her side just in case. I hadn't meant to scare her. Never mind, Dad snapped. That is when he decided to enter the lottery to get Rodney Aldridge, the psychic ghost hunter, and the Haunted Planet TV show to come to our house. Maybe, he mumbled. Maybe, if she's listening, Dad whispered behind his paper, and just low enough that Sheridan couldn't hear him. I had a very bad feeling about this, the kind of feeling that would have settled in my stomach like a jagged lump of ice, if I still had a stomach. I had not seen him excited or happy or even interested in anything for a very long time. The last time I'd seen any trace of feeling in him, other than anger, was that day, the day my mother disappeared. She had gone out with six-week-old Sheridan after Dad had left for work. It wasn't until late that Dad came back with the baby. He looked ten years older than he had when he left the house that morning. Sheridan was screaming when he brought her in. He got a bottle of milk for her and a bottle of whiskey for himself. He fed her, then sang to her and rocked her to sleep. Two hours he sat, long after she had gone to sleep, rocking, singing, drinking. Tears dripped from his chin and stained Sheridan's blanket. But my mother did not return, and I did not know what had become of her. When Sheridan was old enough to ask, he told her Mama had been killed in a car crash. But I didn't believe it. There had been no funeral. Did I mention I've learned a lot in eight years? I know where the legend of the Banshee comes from. The wind here screeches around the corners of the house and wails in the chimney, all the time. When I was alive, it made me curl into a ball and pull the covers over my head. I was just three when my dad came into some money, and we moved all the way from Houston, Texas, to this forgotten farm in rural Ireland. The folk in the village had all said that the old farm was haunted, and that's part of the reason my parents... Luke and Eden Ramsey bought it. Well, the reason my dad bought it. Mama thought it was all rubbish. Dad tried seances and dowsing, Ouija boards and EVP recording. But ghosts only show themselves if they want to, and none of them wanted to. Who could blame them? How would you feel if weird strangers walked around your house with tape recorders asking you stupid questions. The farmhouse had been built long before anyone had even heard of electricity, and its connection to the main power lines was rickety on a good day. We were in such a remote location that even the main power lines were not very main. In a high wind, they were the first to go out and the last to come back on. Sometimes we didn't have electricity for weeks. We didn't own a television and the nearest telephone was about six miles away in the village. Whenever sounds in the darkness frightened me, my mother would sigh and say, There's no such thing as ghosts, Skylar, nor monsters either. I believed her. I believed this lie, she told me, night after shivering night. I desperately wanted to have a little brother or sister to play with. Mostly I made up games for myself out in the crumbling stone barn behind the house. There was an old, half-collapsed hen house attached to it. Mama had tried to raise chickens there for a while when we first moved in. She may as well have put up a sign that read, Free Buffet, written in Fox, of course. After a while she got tired of trying. She seemed to have gotten tired of trying almost everything. 
Maybe that's why she left. Or maybe it was the wind that never stopped blowing. Or the sun that hardly ever shone. My parents had planned someday to live off the grid. You know, grow their own food, generate whatever power they needed to and so on. And homeschool a large, happy brood of children who would grow up and save the world. But plans change. It took them until I was five before my mother got pregnant again. That figures. She was never any good at following through. There were some problems with the pregnancy. Words I couldn't understand. Serious sounding words like gestational hypertension and placenta previa whispered between my parents. Even so, things were not that much different than usual. My mother never had a lot of time for me anyway. With Mama on bed rest most of the time, and Dad at work all day, I was bored to death. Literally. One afternoon, and I think it was summer, but it was hard to tell because it was always cold and always raining. I was out at the old barn pretending I could fly. I was jumping off the ladder to the loft, spreading out my arms to soar. I thought it might help to make bird sounds too, so I screeched like an eagle when I jumped. Landing was a bit tricky, because a part of the wall had fallen in, and the hand-cut stones were scattered all about the floor. Each time, I climbed a little higher. I was more than halfway up, when a loud crack echoed off the granite walls. The rung I was standing on snapped. Funny. I'm sure I heard someone screaming. Was it me? My stomach lurched up into my throat as I fell, but I never felt my head hit the stone. I heard a sharp crunching sound, then my head felt hot. I must have fallen on a bird's nest and broken the eggs. Almost as soon as that occurred to me, everything went black. The next thing I knew, I was floating among the barn rafters, looking down at my body lying on the floor like a pile of cast-off clothes. I thought, with more curiosity than concern, she looks so pale. What's that oozing out of her ear? Earthbound by Artemis Greenleaf. This work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works 3.0 United States License. Environmental sound effects used in this podcast were provided by www.freesound.org. Please check artemisgreenleaf.com for details of specific samples used. If you'd like to leave a comment or learn more about the other projects in progress, please go to www.artemisgreenleaf.com. Dandelion girl, watch your play.